Hello and welcome to the YouTube studio here at the Munich Security Conference. I'm Jack Kelly from TLDR News and we're about to have a conversation about the situation in Russia and the war in Ukraine. Um, and I'm really excited that you're here to kind of give us some more insight into that. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for the invitation. So the war in Ukraine has been going on for nearly a year now, and it looks unlikely to end anytime soon. So how and when do you think the war will eventually end? And what do you think it means for both Russia and Ukraine after the war? Uh, when the war will end when the Putin uh, regime falls. Uh, until that time, it's possible to, to have a ceasefire, but the war will not end until then. There are some people I, I hear say around here that uh, in order for Ukraine to win the war, Russia needs to lose the war. I don't fully agree with that. Putin needs to lose. If Putin loses, both Ukraine and Russia win. Yesterday, you described the invasion of Ukraine as Putin's war, not the people's war. Do you consider the Russian people responsible at all for the war in Ukraine? And what do you think of sanctions that have been targeted not at the Kremlin, but the Russian people? Those Russian people that are able to understand and to feel do feel a certain sense of responsibility for what is going on. People like that, myself included, understand that we need to bear some of the cost of that today and will need to pay the price later as well. But I really don't like it when I hear talk about collective responsibility, because not only does that transform Putin's war into a war of all of Russia, but it also uh, dissipates, uh, makes the picture much fuzzier about who the beneficiaries of this war are. Uh, and it, it suggests that uh, a very broad n number of people are, are beneficiaries of the war. People such as that example, for myself, uh, I've been fighting against this regime for 20 years already, and I'm not benefiting from this war. The opinion polling suggests that a majority of Russian people still support both Putin and the invasion of Ukraine. Is that polling that you trust? And if not, what do you think the Russian people truly feel? To start with, I would certainly not trust any polling that takes place in a dictatorship, let alone in a dictatorship during the time of war. You yourself can imagine what sorts of people agree to answer a sociologist uh, pollster's questions when they see in that pollster a representative of the authorities. But I will agree that a large number of Russians uh, support the war, or, or at least support their government, whether it's waging war or or, or conducting peace talks, they support the government. But there's two kinds of support here. Uh, one kind is, yes, I support my government, but nah, I don't really want to go fight. And the other kind is, I need to defend my home, my family, because if, if we lose this war, uh, bad things will come to my family and my home. And I'm calling for people not to support Putin, not to turn that first kind of support into the second. Because uh, with the first kind of support, uh, he had difficulty mobilizing 300,000 soldiers, while during uh, World War II, the Soviet Union, which at that time had a population roughly similar to today's Russia, was, was able to mobilize 32 million soldiers. Could you tell us a bit more about the divides that are forming within Russian society on this issue? It must be affecting different groups, different families as people form different opinions. What's it like for ordinary Russians in the country, do you think? This is actually, it looks quite horrible. I'll never forget a video I saw on YouTube that uh, was shown in the first days of the war. There was a woman with her child in Kiev uh, talking with her mom who was in Moscow. And she's saying on the phone to her mom, she goes, mom, they're like, they're shooting at us, they're killing us here. And the mom says, that can't be, that's propaganda. And the woman responds, mama, who do you believe? me or TV, and it seems like mom believed TV. This dividing line took place uh, at a generation just slightly, or at an age group slightly younger than my generation. Those 50 and older support the government en masse. 30 and younger uh, don't support en masse, and that gives me hope. Speaking of which, how much longer do you think the Russian public will continue tolerating the war in Ukraine? And do you think that Putin still has enough support to, for another wave of mobilization? Well, when the war started, uh, myself and other people who have studied Russia and, uh, and have been interested in this question said that uh, support for the war, let, let me say that in a different way, tolerance for the toleration for the war 
would last maybe two years. This, this is uh, a number is reached from looking at historical examples. You know, one place where I made a mistake in my judgment was that I thought that huge losses on the battlefield would impact the way people felt about the war. I recall from my youth when the war in Afghanistan was going on, uh, when five times less, maybe even 10 times fewer people than have already died in Ukraine were dead, and people responded to that, reacted to that far more acutely and much more painfully than they are right now. So the value of a human life has become devalued in Russia, and this is very sad. Do you think there's any chance that Putin could end up being removed from power in the near future? And even if you think he's here for the longer term, who do you think comes next? Uh, yeah. I am convinced that in the event of a military defeat, it'll be very difficult for him to hold on to power. But a military defeat is a, a mandatory condition for that. Well, I suppose one could also uh, uh, hope for divine providence, but that doesn't depend on us anymore. Well, uh, who, who after Putin? If Putin disappears today, it would be Mr. Mishustin. This will be neither good nor bad. He's going to attempt to stay the course with the line as it exists today. But Putin's power is very individually based. And it is extremely unlikely that whoever comes to replace him would be able to maintain that balance of forces within the inner circle uh, that Putin has created around himself. So there will, will, after that, there will be the next wave of changes. And here, the West will hold a golden key to what happens next, because any subsequent government is going to be interested in the lifting of, of sanctions. And the whole purpose of my being here these days is to try to convince people that one needs to be very careful and cautious about how one uses this key uh, in order to achieve the right effect from the use of this key. Uh, I have written a book explaining all this. It's called How to Slay a Dragon. And uh, I have, have uh, arranged to have it uh, published and released in German just now in conjunction with this conference. Perfect. Great timing. Um, finally, just before you go, you often describe yourself as a pessimist. But if you were to close your eyes and imagine the most optimistic, realistic scenario for Russia's future, what do you think that looks like? I believe in Russia's ability to remain intact within more or less those borders that it acquired after the collapse of the Soviet Union, on the one hand. On the other hand, I also believe that Russia is capable of not entering yet another circle of authoritarianism after Putin. But in order to have that happen, we will need to immediately establish a uh, suitable system of checks and balances. We should not rely on a scenario where first we'll get ourselves a good Tsar, and then the good Tsar in the goodness of his heart will establish the system of checks and balances. No Tsar is going to establish a system of checks and balances. Three words, federalism, parliamentarism, and local self-control, self-administration. Amazing. Thank you so much for your insight. It's been really interesting to hear your perspective on this. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.